Hi, the following podcast is brought to you by Radical Road Brewery, the best craft beer in the heart of Leslieville. Find them at 1177 Queen Street East. That's Radical Road Brewery. Hey, this is Stevie Solis. I am the executive producer of the film Rumble, the Indians that rock the world. I am a hack guitar player, sometimes fools around a little bit with a guitar. And you are watching Welcome to the Music. Sorry, guys. That's that's okay. As, as long, Stevie, oh, yeah. all we ask is when the movies are done in the credits, just just put our names. It, it could be at the end. It could be. It could be anything. <laughs> yeah, smart play. You're right. That's it. You know, what? <laughs> it's a two o'clock radio interview today too, and they rescheduled for four. I've just I have been so friggin' busy. I mean, you guys know where I've been in the last like four days. Tell us. Tell us. Well, I was at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction yeah. in Cleveland. I was so, in Cincinnati uh, smashing guitars with Bootsy Collins for the opening of the Cincinnati Hard Rock Casino. I was in uh, Florida. I was in Los Angeles. Um, I got into Toronto uh, two days ago. I've been working here. It's just been nonstop. Going, going, going. That is nuts. How how was the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? How was that? A little bit of madness. Yeah. yeah. How was the Rock and Roll Hall What's of Fame? That? Well, you know, I enjoy going and, you know, we had like a table down in the front and I got to see a lot of my old rock star friends. It was Susanna Hoffs was sitting behind me from the Bangles and I used to write songs with her when we were young. Oh, yeah. And Kathy Valentine was sitting next to me on the other table and she's into Go-Go's and was going in. So I was really proud of her. And she's also my been my pal for 25, 30 years or whatever. I'm actually more. I met her in 1988 when I was playing guitar for Rod Stewart and I was a kid. So. Yeah. Um, Hawkins, who I discovered and took on his first world tour. Um, he got in the Hall of Fame playing with the Foo Fighters. And so it was cool. I saw a lot of people I know. It was, um, you know, it's good. To, always good to be at those kind of events for me and re- let everybody remember that I knew a lot of people in the music business, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, Greg and I, Greg and I have a story about uh, Taylor Hawkins. So we'll, uh, maybe we'll save that near the end. Of, Tell me, uh, yeah. Oh, the, oh, I was about to say, you know, Char- I made a movie called Rumble. And yeah, we, yeah. We featured a guy called Charlie Patton, um, who's one of the really the pioneers of the Delta Mississippi blues scene. But he's he's a Choctaw Native American, and he was thanks to Stevie Stevie Van Zant from you know uh, the Sopranos and Bruce Springsteen's band. Yeah. He got in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and that was a big deal for us because most people really didn't know who Charlie Patton was before the movie Rumble came out. That is awesome. Did you get to yeah, play it sure. all over the uh, the weekend, the festivities? No, no, no. I was supposed to play with Earth, Wind, and Fire in Cincinnati, but then I heard there was a great party at the at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame on the Friday night. So we were at, we had a private jet, and we just jumped in the jet, took <laughs> off, and, and uh, got to Cincinnati early and went to that part. I got to Cleveland early and went to that party instead. I was supposed to stay in Cincinnati and jam with Earth, Wind, and Fire, though. Not, not bad for a kid that was homeless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For yeah, a yeah. while, eh? sometimes that happens, right? Yeah. yeah. Tell, tell me about you know this. What, the thing. Is, is, well, hold on, let me just tell you about yeah. that real quick because yeah, at the time it seemed like the worst time of my life, and it probably was. But when I look back at it now, if I wasn't homeless, I never would have met George Clinton, and then George with your George, I never would have met Bootsy Collins, who I was just with in Cincinnati. You know, all those what that was nineteen eighty five, right? Yeah. And then I. But his records, I mean, they never would have introduced me to Thomas Dolby. I would never would have met Don Was and produced Was Not, co-produced Was Not Was and played guitar in that and with those number one records. And so, you know, sometimes those bad things, they happen for a reason. And it is what it is. I mean, thank God I was homeless because it was awful. But man, it was yeah. probably the best thing that ever happened to me. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, tell me about this uh, conversation you had with uh, with Chuck D. At the oh my God. Uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Well, you know, I, I came up, I was doing hip hop records in L.A. in the in the 80s when not a lot of people in L.A. knew much about hip hop in 1987. Yeah. And I was a producer for a guy called David Kirshenbaum, who was a legendary producer, produced Joe Jackson, all the Joe Jackson albums and Super Tramp. And I'm mean, just a huge producer. And at the time, he had produced Tracy Chapman's first album. I was there as a staff producer for that. For that. And... Um, what happened was, is that um, the um, um, 
boom, 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 boom. Um, oh, during that time, I was doing hip hop records for soundtracks like movie Big Shots or the movie Action Jackson with Carl Weathers and Vanity because yeah. no one knew about hip hop. And, and, and David Kirschenbaum would say, Hey, you know anything about these called rap? You know anything about rap music? And I go, Yeah. So I was listening to Run DMC a lot, right? It had heavy guitar and big drum beats. I go, I could do that. And um, there was these young hip hop kids. They were 16. They were called the West Coast Posse. And I, I kind of cut my teeth doing rap music with those guys. And Atlantic released all the records. And, and um, so then I started to work, you know, working with P Funk, George Clinton, and Bootsy Collins. And I was just around it a lot. And yeah, yeah. And then, you know, over the years, I would go to work with this guy called Bill Laswell in New York, and he was doing like, you know, African Bombada and all this stuff. And I did a lot of records with Bill. And, and so I kind of understood that old school hip hop a lot. And one year in the 90s, my buddy Danny Saber was doing an, a remix of Public Enemy Welcome to the Terror Dome for um, the X Games soundtrack album, I think it was called. And I'm like, so he goes, hey, I need you to come play guitar. And, it's, and I'm like, yeah, I want to play a public enemy track for real. So I went to the studio and I jammed on this track. And, you know, Welcome to the Terror Dome. If you know the track, Public Enemy, it's the bomb, man. It's just amazing. And so I played on this thing, forgot all about it. It came out. And that was in the late 90s, maybe or mid, mid 90s. I, I forget. But there I was at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame the other night. And the table went over from mine was Chuck D. And I saw him standing there and I go, I gotta go to tell Chuck D that I played on one of his records. And to my surprise, I was really worried I was gonna bring it up and I thought he was gonna say, like, mm, I never heard it. I never listened to it. <laughs> or I thought he, Yeah, I, I hated that shit. It was Guma, you know, I didn't dig it at all. <laughs> and but I said, I, I gotta tell him Stevie Sauce goes, Yeah, hey Stevie, yeah, I know you. And he goes, I, go, I gotta tell you, I don't know if you know this, but I played on the X Games remix of Welcome to the Terror Dome. And he goes, Oh yeah, you're playing that. <clears throat> Uh, guitar thing he did just like that i go yeah i go i play some guitar and that crazy thing and he goes you know that's my favorite version of the song and i was nice. like what <laughs> i go i told him I you were gonna tell me you hate it and, and <laughs> I, scared. I was kind of scared chuck d seemed so intimidated but he was such an incredible dude and um he told me it was his favorite he said if you look in the video um we actually shot the video to that version of the song on the public enemy website and if you look at blah 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 and i told him man you know, should have got me to play guitar in that video, man, back when I was skinny and good looking. <laughs> and it, you know, we had a good laugh, but it really made me feel good because, you know, the big thing for me has always been credibility and having the what I would think of the greatest musicians in the world. Everyone else on the street doesn't know who I am when I'm walking down the street, but when the yeah. greatest musicians in the world know me and appreciate me, for me, that's, that's the best. And that's also probably why I've had such a long career because I never got so big that I burned out, right? Or pissed too many people off. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, makes sense. Um, you, you talk about the greats, and you mentioned earlier about George Clinton, and you were talking about sort of around the 85 time frame. I have to ask, were you around at the time, or were you but part of it at the time of recording a freaky styling? Because if you were, I'm just going to geek out and just well, stop now. What, what songs, um, what, what album is Party on Your Pussy on? Is that on the first? Let me hold on, hold on, hold on. After the one after Freaky Style, Freaky Style was one George produced, right? Yeah, yeah, that's what I was asking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, I think they did that. In like oh, so Uplift eight. Mofo, Uplift Mofo, Uplift yeah. Mofo Party Plan yeah, yeah. was yeah. George did. Did George do Uplift Freaky Style? He did, but yeah. Okay, and then Uplift Mofo was the next one, and so I'll tell yeah. you, I the 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 Peps were they they did the I didn't move to LA till eighty five, so. By the time I was homeless, I'd only been there eight months. And so I went to, um, I was hanging out in Baby, Baby O Studio, where the place that I used to live on the couch when I met George Clinton. And I, by this time, I'm playing, and, you know, Joe Bootsy's there and, and Mudbone and Jerry Scheider and all the guys. And we're working on every night. We'd be there in the studio hanging out, playing on these tracks for the album that would become R&B Skeletons in the Closet. And the first time I met the Chili Peppers, they came into the studio there august of 1985 and they had all the demos to um <laughs> whatever that record was going to be the next one and i always yeah. remember the song party on your pussy they go wait this song's called party on your pussy and i thought that's crazy they got a song <laughs> you know <laughs> you can do that right and you know boots Collins was like oh that title's gonna get a lot of airplay let me tell you and um but i remember the song you know on the album it was like it was like this fast on the album right but the demo was like and I thought the demo was dope. 
I kind of didn't like the record as much as the demo because the hell it was hell and Jack Irons back then. Oh yeah, yeah. And, and and so then in 1986 ish, 80 early 87 they were I I was producing demos for a girl named Melissa Etheridge and yeah. um she was in the EMI studio and the Chili Peppers used to rehearse in there. I mean they were neat. I used to hang out with them. I remember going to see them at the Rocks and they'd be back in black at about 300 beats per minute and all this. Stuff. It was really fun. And they were all super nice. And Anthony was so nice back then. It was so nice. And he was like a different dude now. But um, that, that, so I, I saw the band a lot and I used to watch him rehearse at EMI and they'd just sitting there and rehearse and Flea would just be like doing his thing. And Flea was always amazing. And, and uh, Anthony, back then, like I said, Anthony was really kind of hell, was super, super cool. Um, it wasn't until later when they got popular that they kind of all went bonkers a little bit, except for Chad, of course. Wow. Yeah. So getting to the movie Rumble, yeah. uh, it seems to start with this, um, I guess, this trip that you and Randy Castillo go on. Um, mm. he, he says, Let me, I want to take you to Indian country. I, yeah. I want to know, bef- like, before that trip happens – where are you? What are you doing? Where's your headspace at in terms of your relationship with your ancestry and, and being in being, you know, well, Aboriginal indigenous, where are you before, before this trip with Randy? That's, that's a, that's a good question. No one ever asked me that. Well, you know, when I grew up, I grew up in San Diego and my father uh, was in the Marines and uh, went and fought in the Korean war, came back, met my mother who had migrated, his family migrated from this area along the border of Arizona and New Mexico and my father had left at 17, this area out in the country outside of Cheyenne, Wyoming. And uh, they met and I was born, you know, many years after the fact. And I lived in Oceanside where I surfed and I skateboarded and I, I, I hung out on the beach like a regular guy. But I always knew I was a Native American. It was no big deal. And we used to spend some time. We'd go to the Paul Indian Reservation. Now it's like a big casino and it's madness. But out there, it used to just be like nothing but this river. And we'd go hike out there and there's rattlesnakes. And, and uh, dogs would chase you and shit. It was just like, but I used to go to Indian Res a lot um, and hang out with my family. But fun, you know, just fun. And um, I grew up native guy, no big deal. Um, you know, you, nobody cared if nobody was like, hey, are you native or hey, are you green? Are you purple? And you know, it, it was just, the, we just, nobody cared. It was just like, it is what it was. We, we all were, we all felt like we were the same. And, um, but what happened was, I, I mean, I always had this side of me that was indigenous and felt like a bit of a, I could probably was filler in another life or something, right? I'm out of my mind. And I attack my guitar like I'm, like I'm murdering somebody sometimes, you know what I mean? It's like weird. And so um, what happened was, I had this big dream of being famous, right? I moved to LA in 1985. I get out of high school. My high school, I quit my high school band. I was doing really well, but I, had, I wanted to be bigger. Get to LA in 85 go through all that madness. By 87, I'm doing really well. All of a sudden, that's like, I've got, I'm doing records for, you know, scoring Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure and uh, doing Action Jackson soundtrack, uh, playing guitars on right, Was Not Was, going to Was Not Was with England, going to England with Was Not Was, going to England with this guy called Zio, who was one of the early Fairlight guys who, who used to work with Paul Oakenfeld and I'm meeting Terrence Trent Darby. I'm doing all this stuff, 87, so my whole life is changing. And everything's starting to happen. But I don't have that much money, but I'm starting to make some money, you know. And and then all of a sudden, I get it in October of 87. I get Andy Taylor quits Duran Duran, does a solo album, and hires me to be his guitar player. It's my first big break. Wow. And I am um, going to go on tour opening for the Psychedelic First. And okay. right before the tour started, Andy fired me. And um, it was devastating to me. I mean, devastating to me. He was, I, I'm not going to say he was intimidated by my plane. Although, you know, because he was really good, too. He was intimidated by the fact that he wanted everyone to sit around and try to be all like some type of hell's angel and some shit. And I wasn't doing that shit. And I was on a whole nother game that I was I was a surfer. And I was like, I was I was ready to explode. And so he fired me. And then I told myself, this is nuts. So I went back to England. I'm, I'm hanging out in the church mm-hmm. and Anorama and all these people. I'm working around. I'm doing all this stuff. And I come home and I and I and I joined Rod Stewart's band. I get a gig with Rod Stewart, produced the tubes and all this other stuff. Then I joined Rod Stewart. And when I joined Rod Stewart, all of a sudden it was like, 
sold out sports arenas, football stadiums, private plane, our own plane, um, supermodels and more supermodels and regular models too. <laughs> and like, you know, <laughs> and like not models, but super fun girls. I mean, it was, I, mean, I lost my mind and every night it was like free drinks everywhere I went. I was celebrated as this hero. Now that I had all the money in the world, I didn't have to spend anything because everything was free, free guitars, free amps, free, everything was, it was like I, I'd done my dream had come true, playing Madison Square Gardens, all these things. I got back to LA in um, 89 and I started to write the Color Code album. My first time I'd signed this huge contract with Island Records and buying houses now. I bought two houses in 1989. Wow. Same, yeah, I was like, things were just madness, big publishing deal. You know, I was going crazy and I was, and I was losing I was losing who I was hmm. being caught in this thing I, in my mind, I wanted to become. And, and the thing I wanted to become only worked if I had the thing I was there as the foundation. And I was hmm. losing, that. I was losing my credibility. I started to care more about people liking me than I, you know, the old me was like, you know, go to hell. This is how I'm going to do my song and fuck off. If you don't understand it, you'll figure it out in five years when I'm gone down another road. And I lost some of that because I wanted people to like me. I wanted people to appreciate. I wanted to still be loved and famous. And that's when, you know, Randy Castillo, we went to London together and, and he saw me just, I just going off the deep end, drinking a lot and drugs and women and forgetting what was really important to me. And that's what he just said. Like, cause he was that guy too. Yeah. He had, he knew how to swing back into the game. So that's when he said, I'm taking you to Indian country, man. You, you know, it was sort of like my time as a, as an indigenous guy to go into an indigenous land and feel something that I had not really felt in a long time since I was a little boy, probably. And he was right. And it, it just chilled my ass right out. And I mean, I was still out of my mind having a great time, but I had, but I understood the balance and I never let it get too far. You know, it started to get too far. Interesting. So what did, what did that mean? So when Randy says I'm taking an Indian country, like where, where are you guys? (laughs) The phrase we call Indian country. Anytime you go like, you know, we were hanging out in the Taos in, in New Mexico itself in general, just feels is Indian country. It just feels like, you know, that's where your ancestors were. That's where my ancestors came from like on my father and mother's side. Um, you know, even when I'm in, I'm six nations, man, I'm an Indian country. I'm in Canada working on six na. I'm an, I'm an Indian country, man. It's, there's Indians all around and there's an energy that's there. Interesting. And, and you need to, you need to remember to tap into that energy, and but you also the people around you need to remember. You know, it's hard because more and more everyone wants to be like a Kardashian or be like all this other stuff. Yeah, and and they forget what's important. Um, but for me, Indian country, my friends there too. I was especially in Taos. This guy, this guy called Carpio, and this other guy called Benito, and these two guys would just be like somehow they would look at me and they'd just say a couple of things. They'd be like, and they're the two guys in Rumble. If you listen with John Trudell and me and we're all in, on, on Taos beating the drum at the end, talking about Randy. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's Benito and Carpio. But those guys, when I was really young, man, we used to hang hard. You know, we'd go steal teepees and we'd do all this crazy shit. <laughs> me, we'd go like, we had a big thing. And I don't mean to sound like a racist, but we'd go find the hottest white girls we could in Taos at the, at the regular places. And they'd all want to come to the res and see your drum or whatever, you know. We used to do crazy shit. So it wasn't like we we're all like, you know, kumbaya or nothing like that but it was yeah. something about it there's just something about it I, I, I'd explain a lot of people ask me that yeah it's, it's, be, it's fun it's funny know. because because um one of our past guests Tom Wilson I don't know if you're familiar yeah. with Tom Wilson right yeah of course and so like you know Tom didn't know he was indigenous until later in life and then yep. it all made sense for him and when you talk about the feeling of being on the land like remember we, we sat with him for probably an hour and a half chatting and it was just yeah. like it just yeah. like that moment you know that's that's funny that you that you 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 there's something about the the realization of things that come to you and and you do you feel it and i don't know it's what it's kind of worked for me and it's it's kept me kept me together and um i'm super grateful i, I spent a lot of time in indian country i mean i spent a lot of time i worked in a native charity i i felt like when i made rumble actually i wanted to do something around 2000 and so i was in canada opening for the rolling stones up at the, the canada rocks or the toronto rocks or whatever it was called it was we called it sarge stock for the yeah, ACD yeah. and all that and I, I i met brian Wright mcleod this writer and he was also a dj 
And he also was like, um, he was like there to teach me about Link Ray and teach me about all these other people. And, oh. and it, it was, it was hitting me that I really needed. And when I say teach me, meaning I knew about them. I just didn't know they were Native Americans, just like most mm-hmm. people did. So yeah. did but I realized that I needed to do something to give something back. And I needed to be known in my lifetime, something more than just being some guy who, who jumped around like a monkey with a guitar in his hand, you know, it's kind of what it started to feel like to me. I'm just, you know, what am I doing up here? You know? And um, that's what happened. And it was my way of wanting to give back. Rumble was really my way of wanting to do one thing for, for the people's people that mm. I could go to sleep at night. And, and if I died, I knew I did something great. It just came yeah. out way better than I ever thought it was going to though. I didn't know that it was, was going to be. Yeah. So before the movie came out, I like you. You come back from this excursion um, with uh, with with Randy, um, but you 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 sort of it starts off. I guess Rumble starts off as this um, exhibit. Is that correct? Um, at uh, at the National Museum of the American Indian, or am I getting yeah. some? Yeah. yeah? yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go what ahead. happened? Okay. So what happened was, I came up to. Six Nations. I was, I was mixing an album in Winnipeg, Canada, in two thousand and six. I think it was, and I was also at the same time working for American Idol, nineteen Entertainment. There, and I think two thousand six. My first idol was Daughtry, and I flew up to mix this album, and I heard about this Native American man who unfortunately just passed away in January, named Kenny Hill, and he was a, a billionaire, and he is a, a Mohawk Indian, and he wanted to build a recording studio and do something amazing for native people. And he asked me to come help. And so I found this, uh, I went to Costa Rica and was producing a band called Gandhi, which is an amazing band in Central America. And I um, found the SSL Abbey Road Studio 3 mixing board there that someone had bought, put in cases, and then it was just sitting there forgotten. And um, we bought it and sent it up to Six Nations. And it's there now in a studio called Jucasa. And, um, the thing is, is that while I, while I was there doing this with um, Kenny, I gave a speech and I said to people, I go, you know, Native people are always trying to find one guy that they can look on TV and see or one person they can see on the mainstream. Yeah. And, and, and uh, I said, that's the wrong way to do it. Everywhere I go in the world, people want to know more about us and know more about our culture. I go, well, we got to forget that. We got to bring the mainstream to Indian country. And Tim Johnson, who is a Mohawk man, who actually from Six Nations, who, who worked in Washington, D.C. and was the co-director of the National Museum of the American Indian, the Smithsonian, said, man, I really like what you had to say. He goes, I'd love to show you the museum. We fly in and come see it. So I jumped on a plane. I went and I saw it. And then he goes, you want, he goes, let's go to New York. I want to show you the New York Museum. So we jumped on a train and took off to New York and um, on the way there, I told him the story of Rumble. I told him the story that I had learned from Brian Wright McLeod while I was opening for the stones about these native guys. And I thought, man, it'd be like something. I got to do something about these people. And he was like, wow, that's amazing. He goes, because they were all associated with these huge things in history. And he says, let's do an exhibit about it. And next thing I know, I have a job at the Smithsonian and like my friends, <laughs> at Paris, I then went my, I, actually, my, my email address was like Stevie Salas, you know, you know, my, uh, I forget what my title was, uh, advisor to contemporary music for the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian Washington, D.C. And I had the address. And, and people would be like, my friends at William Morris, people would be like, dude, what's up? That's legit. What's going on? <laughs> As a musician, you never feel legit. You, you know, you, you know, you're dating someone's someone's daughter and their dad's looking. You're a, you know, you're a musician. I don't want my daughter dating. You know, musicians always get this thing. You're just not legit. <laughs> Even if you're famous, I, there's something wrong. You're some kind of a deviant or something. And this was really the opposite of deviant. It was like the Smithsonian. So I did that for three years. We created this exhibit. It was supposed to be a small exhibit of merit to show some merit to indigenous people to be inspired by, to show that anything was possible. But what ended up happening was it became the most popular exhibit they'd ever had. And we wow. moved it to you four times bigger and it ran for a year. And, and what it did was it changed written history. It was now, cause now it was the Smithsonian and it was documented history 
So then I got off, I finished the exhibit and I said, I need to make this into a movie. That's when I did then. So I started to call people and work with uh, people. And I was already producing a TV series in Canada called Arbor Live on APTN. And um, mm -hmm. then I got a phone call one day. I was living in Niagara on the Lake in Ontario there. And I get a phone call from um, Christina Fawn, the co-producer of Rumble. And she was asking me about a, I had a, I was one of the first guys to have an app, you know, an Apple iPhone guitar game on, a, on an iPhone. And she had a company they were getting into gaming. And I go, I don't want to talk about apps. I go, I want to talk about this movie I want to make. And they had made a movie called Real Engine. And before I knew it, we were making Rumble. And, and that's, that's what happened. Wow. Just like that. Someone calls you to talk about something else and you. Thank yeah. I was homeless and things happened for a reason. So, you know, I'll tell you, though, the Smithsonian was a, a huge thing for us because when I would talk to Steven Tyler or I talked to any of those guys and tell yeah. them the story. Everybody had an insane amount of confidence to be in the movie because they knew that it was legit uh, knowledge because the Smithsonian fleshed everything out. You know, it wasn't like, you know, nobody could say like, oh, come on, man, that guy was not blah, blah, blah. Because it's like, dude, you want to argue with the Smithsonian? You know, it, it, it was, you could not mess with that. It was, it gave us a platform for, to tell everyone to fuck off. If they didn't believe it, you go ask them, you know, it was just bad. It gave me a real, a real sense of power when yeah. I went after people. And as you saw, we saw a million people in the movie, right? It's crazy. Like <laughs> I, I did. I mean, Greg, Greg just saw Greg saw the movie this weekend again with his wife. I saw it over the summer, and you know, there's people there that okay, yeah, I know Robbie Robertson. Yeah, he's he's uh, he's 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 indigenous. Buffy Saint Marie. Yeah, yeah. What Jimi Hendrix? Oh, like, yeah. like I, I'm You're sure other people knew, but I had no clue. My my wife was blown away. She's like 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 she's watching it, and, and this person is like. So what musician isn't? <laughs> well, you know, it's hard to say. The, the key for us at the Smithsonian, and it's the same thing we used for Rumble, was you could say a lot of people have indigenous blood if you're born in America because everyone can go back and have some type of African-American indigenous, indigenous uh, you know, somewhere down the line. Sure. But what we did is we picked people that, that were, they were not just indigenous blood, but they lived the lifestyle like, 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 like this. Like if you saw me in 1990, I may not. I may have said told anyone I was a Native American, but if you looked, you'd see like something like this on me, or something like this, or something on my guitar that was like in, that was always representing my culture. I never was the guy that dressed up like Iron Eyes Cody to go on stage, which you know some people do, and that's that's their thing. But I always had a subtle way of, and it was for me. And so what we did is anybody who didn't live that culture in some way as part of their art artistry then we didn't really include them. Like you could have included, um, you know, you could talk about Elvis Presley and you could talk about um, Wayne Newton and people like that, 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 that have indigenous blood in them, but they, they, they never exercised that part of their culture at all in their mainstream. So we didn't dig into that, you know? Okay. Wow. Hmm. The first time I heard about rumble was through a local artist here in Toronto, um, Jay Soul, Chippewa. I don't know yeah. if you know him, but he he made a number of like fan art posters yeah. uh, based on the movie, and I thought it was so so cool. And based based on our movie, yeah. Oh man, yeah. tell us, and I'd like to see that. Yeah, Chippewa. If you just go on Google, it's so Chippewa oh, Yeah, um, yeah, and just amazing. He's an amazing amazing artist. He just he just had a, a an art installation piece at uh, Harborfront uh, wow. in in Toronto called Genocide. Really powerful. Um, well, if you talk to him, tell him I said hello. I I definitely will. I definitely will. Um, but yeah, so that's you know how how I first heard about it. But um, putting together the movie, you know, you talked about all of these these big stars like Steven Tyler, Taylor Hawkins. We're like, yeah, we're into this. We we know this. You know, this is legit and everything. But putting it together and and getting it out to the masses, how how was sort of the the business side of 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 that movie? Well, first of all, it's funny you put Taylor Hawkins' name in with Steven Tyler. I mean, I found Taylor Hawkins playing in club lingerie in front of twenty people. You know what I mean? And taught him how, didn't teach him how to play drums. He had these natural skills. But yeah. I, if you, you'll read a million articles where he talks about how gnarly and hardcore to him I was when he was young, and I put him in Sash Jordan's band for her Rats tour. You know, fellow yeah. Canadians. And Taylor, 
I don't, you know, I love Taylor. I think Taylor's like my kid brother. I, you know, when I see Steven Tyler, I was a little kid looking at Steven Tyler. I don't put those two in the same game at all. But all right. I love Taylor like my little brother. Yeah. Um, but so, you know, the 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 question you asked me was uh, how did a business end come together? Yeah. yeah. Be, okay, so we were in Toronto at Hot Docs, right? And Christina Fawn and the director, co-director Catherine Bainbridge sat me down uh, uh, in front of every network. And I told them the story of Rumble, but I had the strength of the Smithsonian in my pocket and every single network said yes. I think that's why they all said yes, wow. because they knew this came from the Smithsonian. So therefore it was safe that they weren't going to do something and have it turn out to be all bullshit, right? Yeah. Every network said yes. And the hard part was for Christina to figure out you know, we had we wanted PBS because we wanted a good credible network, but then HBO later on came in and all these things, and it was cool. It was when when we went Sundance, and then all of a sudden the whole place went bonkers. The next thing I'm flying out of stress, flying out of Hungary and all over the world, just with this thing, it was madness. That's that's great. Um, one thing I wanted to you mentioned about Catherine Bainbridge. I wanted to sort of explore that with you because she's also, you know, exec, I think executive produced a few other indigenous documentaries mm. or projects um can you talk about Catherine and her importance and not just to your project but in i'll general? tell you yeah Catherine. what worked about good for me and Catherine was i knew the business i knew music i knew the real business and i knew the inside and, and the dark side and i knew the real the people in a real way like a human being way not like oh uh, i met you through your agent and talked to you for five minutes i mean i knew these guys I've been down in the ditches and the dirt with them right Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, Catherine knew history. Catherine's married to to Ernest, who's this uh, Cree from Chesapeake, and they have indigenous children. And she, and she knew the history. The, the problems were, um, were that I needed to control her anger towards wanting to tell a story by being pissed off by the injustice. Uh-huh. My goal, my goal was to let the injustice come through through osmosis of the story. And you'll feel it. But when you walk out of there, you're going to feel empowered to either do something about it or feel uh, like you just got as told was told a story of a bunch of heroes. That was the key. We wanted to tell stories of heroes, not mm-hmm. stories of victims. And so that's hard to do, you know, because because when you have when you have negativity as like this juicy, tasty steak that's just sitting there and it's really satisfying, this anger is satisfying to to take and it's easy and it's an easy score it's an easy kick your ass but if you really want to do it great you have to refrain from that and you have to find a way to trick the the guy watching the film or the girl watching the film to learn something not feel guilty but feel a sense of injustice that, like it's something should be done about it and if you can do that then it's magic right because i'm tired of films that make that i walk out of the theater and i feel like shit like oh god i feel like so awful this is awful I wanted to feel empowered when you when I saw Rumble, and but I knew there was an injustice there. I just didn't need to hammer everyone with it. Ah, oh, that is that is. I came across in space. I just want to say that it was amazing. Yeah, right on. It was hard to do. It was a hard balance to achieve, but we we did it. Yeah. Do you sometimes like, you know, you talk about Catherine was sort of that that side that she had that energy, but yourself, do you do you find it hard to, I don't know, focus on the positive and, and create superheroes rather than, you know, want to punch people sort of thing. Yeah. You know what, you know why it wasn't hard because like, okay, I'm, I'm hanging out one day in, I don't know, in the nineties, I'm in a recording studio with Ronnie Wood. Let's just say, you know, everyone's going to, Oh, your name dropping, but this is what my life is. This is what I do. So, yeah. you know, I'm in a studio with the Rolling Stones one night I'm hanging out having drinks with Keith and I'm drinking vodka and, I'm, and, and Woody's there. And I asked Woody, since I used to play for Rod Stewart, Woody was the original guitar player with Rod Stewart and faces. Right. Yeah. And, and I remember as a kid, he always had these 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 Zamatis guitars that had like seashells on them, like like this tops. And I always loved those. And so I asked them, I'm like, hey, do you ever still have that Zamatis guitar you used to play like in Faces? Like when I was in like, you know, fourth grade. Because you know who gave me that guitar? Jesse Davis gave me that guitar. And he said it like he was talking about a superhero. Okay. Yeah. So sitting in the studio one day, I'm hanging out with Steven Tyler. He goes, Jesse Ed Davis. He goes, well, I didn't know what the sound of Aerosmith was going to be, but all we listened to is Jesse Ed, called him Jesse Edwin Davis when he's playing with Taj Mahal. And me and Joe Perry, we knew that was the sound of our band. We wanted to trigger on some of the way they did that blues when he played slide. And, you know, so what, it was, what I'm trying to say is that Jeff Beck told me, 
man, Link Ray, me and Jimmy Page, me and Jimmy Page, me and Jimmy Page used to jump around on my mom, my, my, on my bed at my mom's house playing air guitar to Link Ray. Okay. So picture a visual a guy like me who grew up and being a little kid, worshiping Led Zeppelin, worshiping Jeff Beck, worshiping the Stones. And so now I'm, I'm a man and I'm, in, in, and I'm their peer and we're working together and I'm meeting them all, but they're talking to me like, like they're talking about, oh my, like I would talk, oh my God, Jimmy Page came into my dressing room. The first time Jimmy Page ever came into my, my rehearsal studio, both me and Terrence Trent Darby we were in London. We freaked out. You know, we acted cool, but we freaked out. <laughs> and so they were freaking out like that about these native guys. And I said, native people need to see people freak wow. out about native people because most of the times they feel like nobody likes them. And I go, you'd be surprised. These guys, they're just like, oh my God, Lynn Gray, you know, Jesse Davis, you know, Randy Castillo. And um, so I needed Native people to see that. And so therefore, it wasn't hard to make a film about heroes because everyone we interviewed, they were talking about their heroes. It was true and it was real. And, and, and also, they, the, the, that's why we had so many famous people in the film. You could have said it was over. Like, Jesus Christ, how many people got in this film? But I knew that with an indigenous storyline, yeah. if, just one person said, well, let's just say I said, look, come on, I'm not kind of legit. I'm not Jimmy Page, but I'm legit. I've been on the cover of every guitar. Magazine. Well, if I said, you know, Jesse had Davis, uh, Eric, uh, Eric Clapton, and uh, uh, said Jesse had Davis was the greatest guitar player he ever saw. He'd be like, bullshit, maybe. But if Eric Clapton says it, you know, Eric Clapton says this guy's like his favorite guitar player. You know, John Lennon said it's his favorite guitar player. Then people listen. So I knew that we we had to find people that were beyond question to deliver this story. And that's yeah. why I had so many giant celebrities. You didn't want to hear that, uh, um, you know, that uh, this person loved this guy from hearsay. You wanted to hear that person say it. Right. And that's the only way yeah. that the story would really have weight. That's nice. that that makes so much sense. And and to dovetail off what you're just saying there, one of my favorite parts of the movie, I thought, who in 1971 would say to Jackson Brown, you know what? I'm not really feeling that song. Do you have another one? I'm like, come on, come on. <laughs> That's how kind of things were, man. You didn't care so much about that. Guy. You gotta realize that. Yeah. And, like, I came up in the 80s, right? In the late, mid, late 80s. And the money was ridiculous and the, the cost of living wasn't. So, you know, when you're a musician, you, you had enough money. You say, I don't want to play it. That's not, I'm going to go out, you know, I'll see you later. And Jesse had that. But the funny thing about that story was when Jackson told it to me, I was the guy, I interviewed Jackson for that one. And Jackson said, not only did he say, first of all, he said, and I don't hear myself on that song. And he like, yeah. he said he's grabbed his amp and started wrapping his cables up. He wasn't even going to play. Oh, wow. <laughs> try to play another one you know and <sighs> and that was dr my eyes and he goes oh, you think of what come out came out of that that guitar solo right it's just like the riff it's just like brilliant yeah. it was yeah. one, and it was one take he just did it one time and matter of fact jackson yeah. said he did it the one take and normally like i'll do three or four takes and i'll let him edit shit later yeah he's he yeah. the one take and they're like wow that was really good and they're gonna say let's just do one more and he said he think he was wrapping his cables up already <laughs> <laughs> Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, Jackson, Steve. The best man in his wedding. People don't know that. Jackson Brown also gave him a car and realized that Jesse was back on heroin because he found the car parked on the side of the road by the beach. You know, there's a lot of stuff that we have so much information when I interviewed a lot of these people that we, that is, that's not in the film, you know, but it was fascinating. You're, you're in town um, making or parts for doing stuff around a couple of movies, a couple of projects. Uh, yeah. Wondering if you can actually before I get there, Stevie, before I get there, well, I want to wrap up this discussion on Rumble. It's been out for a while now. It's it's played everywhere. Um, is there like a next phase for Rumble or are we like just we are we working on other stuff now? I'm not doing another thing of Rumble. I did that already. But Catherine yeah. making some films that are sort of. Uh, partnership films with the continuing of the same style of story of, of uh, entertainment, maybe in ma things like that mainstream and indigenous people. Um, yeah. She's doing that. Yeah. And, um, but I'm not, I'm, I, I already did that. I'd like to make a, I would love to make a 
a, a film like La Bamba was about Richie Valens about, I like to film, make a film like that about Link Ray. I've talked to Robert Rodriguez a zillion times about it. You know, I'd like to make a film like that about Jesse Ed Davis. I find his story to be so amazing. You know him. And he, Jesse Ed Davis is the only guy that's ever played with all four Beatles. You know that? Wow. With all four Beatles. I, 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 I caught that in the documentary again. We caught up on it on the weekend. And I'm like, oh my God, it's all like everyone. Yeah. And yeah. Honestly, how does everybody not know that guy's name? Everybody knows, uh, yeah. you know, uh, Billy, uh, um, you know, a keyboard player. Um, he just got in Rock and Roll Hall of Fame this weekend. Um, I'm blanking on his name. You know, he could go down in circles. And what the heck is his name? Is Billy? Uh, <laughs> I'm blanking right now. But he also played with the Stones. And he played with, with all the, he was in the Beatles. When everyone talks about him as the fifth Beatle. But just oh, like yeah. this. Jesse played with all four Beatles, man, and people don't even know his name. He played with the Stones. He played with, yeah. played with, you know, he played with uh, Rod Stewart. He played with Jackson Brown. He played with all these people. It was John Lennon's favorite guitar player, and people don't even know his name. And 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 you got to think that sometimes this thing about Indigenous people being invisible is somewhat true. You know, who doesn't know that? How do you not know that guy? Like a like, in the, why is he not in every book that talks about the Beatles? Talking about Jesse Davis. Talking about you know. That's so true. So, and so I want to get to um, other projects that you're working on. Um, I know that there's uh, where I've read, so maybe, maybe it's happening, maybe it's not. There's a movie coming out or you're working on uh, something about the water crisis. Um, mm -hmm. what, what other stuff are you, are you are you thinking about and working on right now, Stevie? Well, I started a company in Canada. So now I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a dual citizen. I'm a Canadian and, a, and a, an American. Okay. And we started a little company on Six Nations, me and a guy called Brian Porter, and it's called, and there's, the guy who runs the office is an amazing singer who was my hero growing up in San Diego, a guy called Rob Lamoth from the River Dogs. I don't know if you guys knew Rob, the singer. He's amazing. But we, we started a little company called Seen Red Six Nations, and we're on the res. We're 100% Indigenous owned, and we want to make projects that are, that amplify stories that we think need to be told and do it in a way that's not, um, you know, I don't want to tell a race story and, and be a racist by doing it. You know what I mean? I, I yeah. hate that. Yeah. I think this is the problem we have right now is everyone's complaining about racism. So then we're turning into reverse racism. So we're becoming racist by talking about it. I just don't think, I think any of that is right. And, and so we're not doing that. So we're doing like a film right now called Boiler Alert. We're, you know, People have no idea, just like nobody had the idea about these people in Rumble. They have no idea that there's 1,100 communities on, in Indian country and non-Indian country that are on boil alert. They, they don't even have drinking water. You know, Adam Beach grew up having to go to the bathroom in a bucket, you know, in a civilized country, in a first nation, you know, a first nation, I, no pun intended, in a first world country. And, you know, we need to tell this story because I think, Part of getting the thing the problem solved is creating the awareness, and the awareness then creates the, the the feeling of injustice that people need to actually step up and do something about it. Yeah, yeah. I made a film also about Autumn Pelter, the Water Walker, which is a short doc. It's a beautiful young uh, Ashinaabe water protector. There was a teenager. She speaks at Davos and United Nations with Greta. Matter of fact, she just got a big award from in Monaco this weekend, um, and she's doing. Is she from Wiki? Is this, she's from Wiki, yes. right? Mantua. Yes. And yeah, so yeah. You go, go look on her on her page and look on my page. We shared it. Here she is with, yeah. with Prince Philip, and, or whatever his name, from Monaco. And she's getting this huge award, and it's a prestigious award. And she's not a, there's not one thing written about it in Canada this week. Not one thing. Wow. Yeah. Except that's on the Mantua and Expositor. Hmm? No, I said, except on the man, in the Mantua and Expositor. No, I'm just... Mm -hmm. And I'm going, to, I'm going to say this. I'm going to say this with all respect. Uh, my family's been from the Manitoulin and for like five generations. I realize that's nothing in the grand scheme of things. I, I spent a lot of time up there. So uh, tell you what, there are a lot of mosquitoes up there. Last time I went up, they got eaten alive. <laughs> Kareem's been up to our place a couple of times and, and hung out. So yeah, you know. Well, let let yeah, us know yeah. the next next time you uh, you head up there. We'd love to. We'd yeah, love to host you. you. Oh no, are you guys in Manitoulin? I mean, we're both in Toronto, but actually during much of the pandemic, because my wife's a teacher, we've actually spent much of our time up on the Manitoulin at the place up there. So just sort of hide. Do you know, the John Who's do you know that? Do you know that band, the Johnnies? 
I don't. I don't think so. This really cool indigenous punk rock band, and they're like the Ramones, but they're called the Johnnies. And the singer is Veronica Johnny, and her boyfriend's Dave, her husband's Dave Johnny. And um, I recently just did a bunch of remixes for them for their new record. And it sounds really good. And I, I'm doing this thing in, with young musicians. I'm tired of, of hearing young musicians, especially indigenous musicians, making records that are not great. And, and they have plenty of money to do it right, but they're doing them wrong with the wrong people. And, and then when they're not successful, they blame it on racism. I, I'm just tired of that too. So I'm taking some records and I'm saying, okay, give me that record. You put it out, did nothing. Hang on, give it to me. And I go to this guy, Kevin Gutierrez, who just mixed Paul McCartney around. And we did these mixes. And instantly her song went to number nine on the charts. And I go, you just got to find the right people and do it right. Right now we're doing the same thing with this really great uh, producer named Thor uh, for a kid called Jay Smart on Six Nations. I just, I could just give me the vocal track and let me do the rest. And I'll show you what it really should sound like. I sent it back. It was like, oh my God, I didn't know my vocals could sound like that. So I, I'd like to see, you know, people search out and find great people to work with. You know, it's hard now. I, I know this because when I was a kid, um, when I was in LA, I, you know, a guy from AM heard I was some kind of a talented young guitarist and, and he met me and he goes, okay, come in my office. And he'd say like, here's 10,000 bucks, which was a ton of money. And he said, go into a studio. But back then studios were cost a fortune, you know, and go into a studio and take this engineer and he gave me a guy's number and try some of these song ideas you have out. And let's see, man, I come back in a month and be like, eh, this song sucks. <laughs> what the hell is this? And he goes, this one's pretty cool. Hold on. Okay. And then he goes, Let's try something a little different. If you can go in this direction, give me some more money. And then I want you to go to London and I want you to work with this guy and blah, blah, blah. And, and they develop you. And you would work with these amazing, talented engineers and mixers and, and, and writers. And, and, you know, and you would learn so much. And, and still, the threshold to get a recording contract was just only this, this many people got a recording contract when everybody, you know. So getting a major level recording contract was just like almost impossible. And so when I got my first one, it was just like, oh, you know, it's like, so I, I now people think that just because you can go and what most people put out now is what we would have just called our demos, you know, then, you know, and a lot of people spend too much time not thinking about the song and thinking about, and at the end of the day, the singer is, is, is almost all that matters in many ways. You could be, you know, the difference between Van Halen being selling 80 million records and and Ingve Malmsteen selling you know <laughs> five million or whatever he sold I don't know mm. it's a singer and people David Lee Roth was singing he's not even a great singer and he was rocking us shit you know what I mean <laughs> so therefore you know then the girls liked it and then the girls like it the guys like it anyway because Eddie was already ripping you know so people forget about these little <laughs> things when it comes to marketing and how to make a better record who your audience is really right yeah yeah um, I I read I heard somewhere that. Uh, that you know, speaking of music that sounds good and stuff, you don't like listening to your own music. I hate that, it. Yeah. Hate so, it. so, so with me, I don't know about Greg because Greg always busts my balls and say, "Cream, you got to listen to the podcast." I, I mixed it and everything, and before you set, you know, before you make it go live, listen to it. I cannot stand the sound of my own voice. Yeah, yeah it sounds different. <laughs> right? Yeah, like it's first weird. Time I've ever heard an answering machine or something. That's me. Yeah. No, you know, it's not just my voice that bugs me. It's, it's, I, I'll, I'll hear like a snare drum thing or, or I'll hear and that something's that bugs the shit out of me that I want to go back and, and I'm crazy because I know that I couldn't be as successful as I was when I wasn't all that successful, but I was able to tour around the world. For, still to this day, I get offers to play all over the world, you know, and only sold a couple million solo albums. But when I listen to it, I'm listening to all the wrong things mm. and I produce myself. So you would think I wouldn't be able to produce myself, but I, I do, but I, I get it done fast. And I, I don't want to know about it. And I throw it out. Maybe that was the secret of my success. I didn't, when I obsess over stuff too much, I don't think it was as good. And also that's the problem with pro tools now, because you can obsess and you can fix mm -hmm. everything. Where when I, I had a big song, that was huge for me called tell your story walking. And if you were to put that on a grid now, I cut that 94 and huge song for me around the world but if i was to put that on a grid now it's definitely not on a grid and you know i mean somebody was telling me a, a story about a rolling stone song under my thumb or something it starts at like 109 beats per minute and by the end of the song dun, 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 it's like 118 beats per minute 
but you don't feel that, right? And that would never happen today because they're like, you'd be on that grid, on that click track, so they can edit, they yeah. can take this, put it here. And, and so music's lost something with that obsession of obsessing over every detail. Mm. And I hear these details and they drive me bonkers, right? So I don't like listening to my records. But Sometimes I'll be in a club, like in some weird country, and one of my songs, will come out, I'll see the people start screaming and dancing. And then I listen to it that way. And as a fan, I go, wow, this is badass. You know, but if I sit in a car and someone goes, hey, man, let's listen to your song. I'm like, turn it off, turn it off. You know, <laughs> I get really upset. It gives me, oh, it gives me anxiety really bad. Yeah. Wow. You, you yeah. mentioned about touring all over the world. Um, you're huge in Japan. Um, how, does, <laughs> how does this happen? Why do the stars go on shining? Why does the sea rush to shore? Who fucking knows? I don't, um, I don't know. You know, I was, I, my first album came out and I was, I did really well press wise, but my, my album didn't do so well because I was on Island Records distributed by Warner Brothers. Polygram bought Warner Brothers. My album was falling through the cracks. Polygram couldn't take it. I was opening for Joe Satriani, which was really tough because I wasn't trying to be no guitar hero. But that tour made me a guitar hero, kind of, right? All of a sudden, I was in all the guitar magazines, guitar readers poll, winners, and all that stuff. And um, I go to Europe, and there I'm much more of an alternative artist. And I'm much treated more like this cool, you know, something different. It was a different kind of vibe. Like, I was more of a care style alternative artist, and they loved me there. And I toured with 24-7 Spies and my band. And, and you know, I get kids that were into Hendrix and James Brown. And, and it was a different audience for me in Europe. But in Japan... I go to Japan on, on the, you know, the, that's the ending part of my world tour that year. And I, every kid singing every word to every song wow. and every, screaming or ripping my fucking hair out and my clothes off and like the Beatles. And I don't know why. And I, and I didn't care because I was making some money and it was super fun to finally have my own audience. And like, they love me. I, one night sold out, two nights sold out, three nights sold out, four nights sold out. You know, it's like, it was just the, best the best feeling because after not being successful in america with my first album to have some of that kind of success sort of saved my psyche because i just came mm -hmm. off non-stop success you know george bootsy uh bill and ted's excellent adventure um was not was uh rod stewart uh, i was just everything i did was getting huge and huge and huge and huge and then my album didn't do that well and uh, japan sort of saved me so then japan wow. for 10 years mm. for 10 years i don't know why but they they just worshipped me there, and 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 quite honestly, it sounds crazy, but I became a millionaire purely because of Japan. I had these huge contracts and stuff, but in Japan, that money was pure and massive, extra money coming in, and 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 it was so I was so grateful for it. But nobody knew what was going on because there was no internet, right? So nobody knew. I'd come home and everyone go, "How'd you, how'd you get a new Mercedes Benz?" It's like, you know, you're out bombed or whatever, and nobody even know <laughs> that. And I go, you should see me. And someone tore my shirt off of me last night in the bushes. I was walking by, you know, no one had any idea. And, and so that was a little unsatisfying to people. I, I remember Steve Luke there asked Richie Cotson, who was my neighbor in Hollywood Hills. He goes, what's he doing to get all his money? And I think he thought I was a drug dealer. And, <laughs> and I'm not kidding. And so it was a little bit dissatisfying. So then I went through the 2000s. I started producing TV, um, do, you know, film, rumble. And in 2017, 2016, out of the blue, I had a friend in Japan named Koshi Inaba, and he's in a band called The Bees, and he'd been my friend since 1992 or 91, and I used to play on his solo albums, and we used to hang out, and his guitar player, Tak Matsumoto, would play on my records, I'd play on his records, we, we, we were friends, we were friends, right? And um, Koshi calls me in 2016, and by this time, he's the biggest selling recording artist in the history of Japan. He's sold over 100 million records, and he is just a giant. He, he, he sells more nights at the Tokyo Dome than Rolling Stones. He says to me, I'm really burned out and I'm really uninspired. He goes, you, you, you think you want to come over and maybe try to write a song with me? I just something to do. And I'm like, yeah. So I jumped on a plane, I flew to Tokyo and, um, and I sat in the studio with him and I said, I go, let's not write a Stevie Sala song with you singing. And let's not write a Koshi Nava song with me playing. I go, let's just do this thing. I go, when I lived in London, England in 1987 and 88, I go, we would have, the song would have to have some kind of a dance beat to it, like Duran Duran or Tears for Fears or Thomas Dolby, you know, you had to be able to dance to it. 
Then it had synth bass, so it'd be like bam, 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 bam. and then it had slap bass, bam, 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 bam. you know. So I go, let's just do it. Everything has to have synth bass and slap bass, and you got to be able to dance to it. And then I'm going to make all the guitars sound like the Clash, all distorted and lo-fi. He goes, let's do it. it. Sounds fun. So we just started knocking these songs out, and every time we do three songs, and we'd go, these, these are pretty fucking good songs, man. This is really cool. And and then I come back again. We did three more. Pretty soon, one day, his manager says to me. Hey, by the way, you guys got to go on tour. We're going to release this record. And I go, record? I haven't even put the guitars. I still had scratch guitars and shit on. So I rushed and got it done. They announced a tour. The tour sold out in like four minutes. And it was like thousands and thousands of tickets. And we went over and we did this thing called the Nava Solace. And, and, and I had this, since he was so famous, he wanted to play with, with people that were his heroes. So I called uh, Stuart Zender from Jamiroquai, play bass. And I called... Amp Fiddler from Parliament Funkadelic, who I used to play with George Clinton with and was and was not was with me to play since. And he played with mm-hmm. Seal and everybody else. And I'd work with Seal. And, and then I called um, and I and I called Matt Sherrod, who was my drummer on and off. And he was the drummer for Beck and the drummer for Crowded House. And we put this band together and we just went and did these shows. And every night it was just. <sighs> so we did another record. And and now I'm now all of a sudden I'm bigger than I ever was in Japan. I mean, it's madness because of Koshi. And so we do another album. I come back. He calls me. He goes, he goes, can you come over next week? I, they want us to be on the cover of Rolling Stone. We should do that, right? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so I do the cover of Rolling Stone. The album comes out. It debuts at number one. It's my first ever number one as me as the artist. First time ever. Here it is 100 years later. And I have my first number one as an artist. I've been. Go. Yeah, thanks. In 2020. So I'm having, I'm a, so, so, you know, I've been on number one records playing and of other people's. But yeah. this is my. I wrote the song, I produced it. it was like, yeah. And it's 2020, March, album comes out. We, so, we put a tour on sale in February. 90,000 tickets sold in four minutes, multiple nights in sports arena. And by third week of March, we had to cancel the whole fucking thing. Oh, so man. now in 2020, I'm on the cover of Rolling Stone. I've got the biggest sold out tour of my lifetime doing like, imagine doing four nights at Madison Square Gardens and four nights at the LA Forum. It's like that, that big. And and uh, I'm on the cover of Rolling Stone and I'm and, and all this and everything has to cancel. And I had to sit home for the year. And so it is what it is, right? You got to have the Things are just meant to be, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, he, get, you know, it stopped me from buying another house, I guess, because that was like the kind of tour. <laughs> 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 so s- speaking of, uh, of, of selling out places um, and we, and we, I have to apologize. Um, we, we should have prepped you a little bit, uh, but that's on me. But but you've got some great stories. So I'm sure you won't have any trouble with this. We question. just jumped right into the conversation. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we didn't we didn't prep nothing. We just started. That's um, all right. As long as you know your business, that's the most important. I hate when people go. So tell me what you do, and you're like, "Fuck you, about that." <laughs> 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 that that's my next question. No, um, we have a segment called Lost Venues. So places that you've played before, places that you've loved playing at that just no longer exist. Uh, so I'm wondering, Stevie, is, is there, and it could be anywhere in the world, is there, is there a place that you hold dear to your heart that, you know, we, we cannot go to anymore? I'm curious about this place. Can you still go to the Maple Leaf Garden? Nope. To buy groceries well, you can if you want to groceries. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> it's a grocery yeah, store. I have, I have at least seven or eight amazing gigs there. The Montreal Forum was another great one. I used to love to play. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's there anymore. They still have the LA Forum, um, but you know, but everyone plays. I, I ended up playing Stable Center towards the end of my career more, and, but the Forum is still like the coolest. Um, mm-hmm. The places like, like where would I think would be like my favorite? I like the big places. You know what I mean? I really yeah. like the, the big giant places. Jack Murphy Stadium, in San Diego. Can never play that again. It's gone. You know, well, I tell, played, tell, let's tell me about Maple Leaf Gardens. Who did you play with there? Okay, so in 1988, I'd never been to Toronto. I joined Rod Stewart's band, like I tell you. Yeah. Never kind of been that many places. For some reason, Toronto were just gigantic in 1988. I mean, massive. So we we did multiple, multiple, multiple nights at Maple Leaf Garden. Then we go down the street and play at the CNE. And then we go down and play at at Hamilton, you know, I, I, I work near Hamilton now, but at the time I was like, where are we? This is weird. And everyone looks strange here. You know, it was like <laughs> a whole different game than Hamilton in 1980. I was like, this is a weird place. And then uh, we played the cops and we'd play all these in the same nights. And we'd come back and we'd come back and we'd come back. I played Maple Leaf Garden 
with Rod Stewart probably seven times. Wow. I played played on Maple Leaf Gardens. I might have jammed with Jeff Healy there. And I think I might have played with Seth Jordan there. I, I think I played there with Duran Duran, or maybe we didn't. Maybe we played the Amphitheater. Amphitheater. I don't remember Duran Duran in 93 in the Tanner Strength Diary. Um, I, you know, I play, I've been there a bunch, though. I've been there a bunch. Uh, I've been a huge fan of Jeff Healy. How, how was it playing with him? Imagine, man. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Jeff, I used to jam with him a lot. And I'll tell you, the first time that I met him was um, we were – it was the MTV Awards, I believe. And afterwards, there was an after party at the China Club in Los Angeles. And everybody who was anybody was there. Anybody. And Jeff at the time, it might have been 1989 or 88, 90 or 88. It's on that ballpark. He was considered by everybody to be that guy. Every guitar player, whether flash or heavy metal guitar player or hard yeah. player, blues guitar player, everybody wanted to see him. And, you know, and, and he was hanging out with Clapton and Stevie Ray and he was doing, he was, he was the guy. And um, they were, they were at the China club and, the, and, and Joe Rockman, who I didn't know at the time was at the bar and I was getting a drink. And at the time I was starting to write Sass Jordan's Racine album with her, some of that album with her. And so she was Canadian and they were friends with Sass. So I said, Hey, Joe, we saw this, you know, blah, blah. And, you know, you guys were open for us one time or something like that. And I go, and I'm, I've been working with Sass Jordan. And, you know, and she's a friend. He goes, oh, my God. And being a good Canadian, especially back then, he was like, I was the only guy. They, they felt like they knew because I knew a Canadian. <laughs> and they were real Canadian. And I was yeah. really Canadian. And so they go on stage to jam. And someone goes, hey, Jeff, you know, Stevie Salas is here. And Jeff Healy and everyone goes, man, a lot of good friends out tonight, especially our friend Stevie Salas. You want to come out and play, Stevie? I was like, what? So fucking people were so pissed off. Everyone wanted to play but because I knew a Canadian from from Toronto that is their friend. That yeah. was their only buddy they trusted. And I got up and jammed with Healy and people were really jealous. So we hit it off great. Me and Tom Stevens became my best friends and Jeff. And, and then, you know, I'd see them all the time. And I'd sit in with them and I started writing songs with them and um, wrote quite a few songs with them on their different records. And, and, uh, I remember one night, the crazy thing about Jeff Healy was, okay, yeah, yeah, he's blind, obviously, but he's blind. So one night I'm driving down Sunset Boulevard in a passenger seat of my friend Heidi Richmond's little Mercedes Benz. And I look and I, it's closing time in front of the Roxy and the Rainbow. And, um, and, and there's all these people everywhere, like it used to be on Sunset, down in front of the Rainbow, madness. And there's Jeff by himself. Like with a, like a cane thing. And he's like looking around doing this like this and, and I could, he's got nobody with him. And I don't know what he's doing. So I rolled the window down and from the street. I go, hey, Jeff, what are you doing? And he goes, hey, Stevie. He knew my voice <laughs> like, like wow. that. Proud of people. Because, you know, his senses were just so much hyper. Yeah, yeah. hyper and he, I just said, hey, Jeff, what are you doing? He goes, hey, Stevie. I mean, right away, he didn't even hesitate. He knew right away it was me. So I got him in the car and I took him back to the hotel to La Park. And, and. And so I, I, I had really amazing times with, with Jeff and Tom and Joan. And we, I remember in 93, they came in from Spain and I was playing in England and we'd go play together. And, and, and uh, Tom was a real ladies man back then. So, you know, it was madness. We had a lot, me and the Healy boys always had a lot of fun and, and loved playing together and recording together and writing together. It was really, really good. That is That's awesome. awesome. That's awesome. It's, 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 it's interesting. Cause we had Rick Emmett on the show from Triumph Rick Emmett. Just yeah the one before this as we're recording and uh yeah we had a lot of we had a lot of good memories to share with jeff Healy as well so oh, that's yeah it's well, jeff could be, that story. he could be the meanest guy you ever saw man he could be a, a bear and but he was also quite a gentle gentle soul too yeah yeah well yeah. yeah absolutely so so stevie one of the questions we'd like to ask our guests before we wrap it up is um what's in your earbuds lately what are you listening to that everybody should be checking out I got to think about that. What have I been listening to? I've mostly been listening to the same old stuff I used to listen to. I've been listening to a lot of, of uh, James Brown. And I've been listening to something I was just really into. I'm trying to think what it was. I can't even remember. I really don't listen to that much music anymore, believe it or not. I'm really okay. focused on trips, but I'm trying to think like, what was it that I've been listening to? 
you know, I don't know if you guys know this, but I, I did the dead and gone with TI and Justin Timberlake. Yeah. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I didn't, I didn't even know. I didn't know who TI was. Justin called me and I got in the studio and, and then I didn't even know what songs I was playing on. And then one day I came on the number one song on the record. And, um, I, I got to, I didn't even know that either. I didn't listen to that. <laughs> Pretty cool. What I just did. I was like, all right. I have to kill it. And, and, uh, but I tell you what, I've been listening to that Public Enemy remix that played on from 1998 or six or whatever that was. And that I still like old school shit. That's my favorite favorite shit. Recently, I did a gig with DMC from Run DMC and and, and mm-hmm. Mark McGrath, which was jammed, and Eddie Martinez played, and Matt Swan was drumming, and um, we did a set of Run DMC songs, and, and I still love that stuff so much. You know? Yeah. 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 I said, before we let you go and Stevie, uh, thank you so much for your, your time with us. Uh, yeah. this has been right. great. I, I think we could talk like for hours, but, um, I, I'm hoping that if you had a good time that maybe we can do this again sometime, Anytime, uh, you know, just make sure you stay on me. Like you go like, Hey, I'll see you Tuesday. And then <laughs> Tuesday. You got to tomorrow you got, you got, I'm really bad at that. No worries. Yeah. No worries. And by the way, we had, we right. had Tom on, he wrote this book. You um, see those people? In that book, there's a couple of stories in there. I can't believe he told that story about us with five girls and six girls. Oh, or something. yeah. And they yeah. said, that people, and him, I'm sitting there against the wall at his house. I've been so hammered. I, I'd have to look specifically <laughs> for. Uh, look, there's a big picture of me and Tom against the wall there. And I'll have to look, yeah. After a big night with uh, blah, 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 and all these girls. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, what are you doing? Yeah, you'll see a big picture. It's a full page picture of me and Tom laid out against the wall. I'll check that out. How do you know how he's doing? I know he had some health uh, challenges in the past. Says he's better. Says he's one hundred percent better now. Nice. Yeah. That is yeah. awesome. So yeah, I, 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 I told you we, we had a story to tell you. I, th- I think this is a great way to, uh, to to end this off. So about a year and a half ago, uh, Greg and <laughs> You're I going here. I'm You're going, going here. there. Why not? <laughs> okay. All right. All right. So Stevie, a, a, a year and a half ago, uh, Greg and I had a chance to chat with Sass. Yeah. Uh, Great, great conversation. It was one of our favorite episodes. Like we just, oh, my my wife, we were up in the man too. Only time my wife's like, I have not heard you laugh so much during a podcast recording as when you were <laughs> with Sass. Yeah, anyway, sorry. And I, and I think we sang together as well on that okay. episode. I think one of her, <laughs> it might have been one of her songs or something like that. Um, but anyway, so we're chatting. I hope it was one of my songs. It, it, well, it might have been. Yeah, it might have been one of the songs that you guys wrote together. Um, but anyways, you know, we had a great time and I had never done this before. Um, but I asked her, I said, Hey, listen, we've had a great time. Can you put me in touch with, so I asked for you, your name. Uh, I sent you an email, but I probably mistyped it or whatever. But again, a year and a half ago, uh, and she gave us the name of, and we're not going to say his name, uh, but the name of the drummer that that you introduced her to we, we call him we call him matt damon because yeah. he's like our version of matt damon yeah okay so, so he's texting back and forth with the drummer that's on, on the very beginning or one of the beginning interviews on your movie and he said well actually i'll leave that to you Sorry, go ahead. so i i called him so no i, I texted him you know who i'm talking to right so that's it yeah, so I, I texted him, uh, and and he calls me, and yeah. so I, I swear to you, I swear to you, he's a regular called, dude. Yeah. He's a regular dude. Yeah, so he called. Now we're in the middle of the pandemic, so you know, Greg and I are assuming that's a free every time people are not doing anything. So he gives me a call. I said, "Hey," and I'm I'm freaking out because I'm making dinner. I run to the house, talk to him on the phone and on on my patio. Uh, and I say, yeah, we'd love to have you on. And I don't know if he thought, you know, we'd love to have you on now that it was a radio guy. Um, he says, yeah, he'll talk whenever he's not doing much. He needs to go do something with his daughter, I think he said. And um, I said, perfect. I'll call you tomorrow. Well, Stevie, a year and a half has passed. <laughs> and and Greg said, every time I go, Greg, should I should I call him again? Greg says, forget it. Just just don't call him. Um, he doesn't you don't answer his so yeah, so 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 I'm going to ask you this, and and whatever answer you give me is fine. We're not expecting, <laughs> but could you put in a, a word for us? And you say, know what? I didn't. Just I say we're nice guys. I 
him at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame the other night. I kissed him on the top of the head and gave him a big hug. We were both <laughs> That's the first time I've talked to him in quite a while. I had him playing the Anaba Solace album. But let me tell you, he got he got pissed off at me. Oh, boy. Because him and I were talking, we were both pissed off that Dave Abergees got snubbed by the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and Pearl Jam wasn't insisting that he go in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame with Pearl Jam. And, and Taylor said to me, yeah, that's bullshit. And I go, it is bullshit. And I kind of feel like I raised Taylor. I feel like I raised Taylor, like my, my own half son, half little brother. And I knew what kind of a, this shit should have not sat with him, you know? And rock and roll people should see like, I'm not going to sit for this shit. But these days they're all like, oh, I don't want to get, don't want to raise any, raise any, get any problems, you know? And I'm, I mean, when I grew up, every rock and roll guy created problems, you know, when problems need to be created. So something bad happened. It wasn't that bad actually. But so what happened was, there was a thing on my Facebook page and Taylor and I were talking and I'm talking months though. And, and all of a sudden it was like, I'm really pissed off about the fact that Pearl Jones not going to uh, letting Dave Abersees in the Rock and Roll Fame because David plays with me a lot. He's played with me for years and he's, he was the, he was the engine of Pearl Jam. Their biggest years was Dave Abersees. And I think this is shitty. It's not right. And uh, I was talking to Taylor and Taylor being a drummer and, and he, it doesn't sit well with him either. And, and it said something like David, David was going to, uh, Taylor was going to talk to, to Grohl and, and uh, that's all it said. And it was like some little write up thing or something. It wasn't even major, but what happened was like eight months later, when it's getting close to the rock and roll hall of fame, somebody took that hall, somebody took that thing on the, um, on the, um, what you call it on the, on the Facebook post or Instagram post or whatever it was. And they um, they um, took it and put it in a British magazine as big as life. And it said, Dave Grohl, the Foo Fighters, are pissed off about Dave Abergees in the Hawk Roll Hall of Fame. Right? They did one of those things that writers do, right? And Taylor calls me. He's fucking in rehearsal with, with Grohl, and he's pissed off. And I don't know what he's talking about. And he kind of explains it to me, and I go, dude. That was that thing, you know, like eight or nine months ago. Remember, we were on the phone and we were talking about that thing. Because he goes, Yeah, you didn't give him that story, right? I go, Of course not. He was like, Oh, okay. But he was all like, oh, sure, sure, sure. And then we just never spoke again. Uh, and I was a little yeah. bit pissed because I think he, I think that David needed, okay, let me tell you, Taylor gets the gig with Alanis Morissette. Okay. He comes to my house and the first guy he tells. Okay. David got the gig with the Foo Fighters. He showed up in this pickup truck at my house in the Hollywood Hills. I'm one of the first guys he told. You know, me and Taylor got this thing like that, right? So Taylor, one day, is on tour with Lannis Moore said, I think it's 1994, 95. I don't know what year it was. I don't know. And Dave Abergees is at my Hollywood Hills house and hanging out for a bunch of days. And we're recording tracks for a new color code album. And um, Taylor calls up from tour. Hey, what's going on? I go, I'm just hanging out, blah, blah, blah. I go, I go, Abrazees is over here in, uh, hanging out right now. And he goes, Dave Abrazees, Dave Abrazees. Because at this time, David Abrazees was the most famous drummer in the world. Dave Abrazees is there. Oh, my God, you're kidding. I go, yeah, you want to say hi? He's washing dishes. Because he wants to say hi. <laughs> washing dishes in my sink. And so I give him the phone. And Abrazees being the cool guy is just like, hey, Taylor, what's going on, Dave? And Taylor's just like a little kid. Like, oh, my God. Blah, 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 blah. You know, he's a fan. Like, we all are fans. You know, so I thought back to that time. And he was such a fan. David's and David was so kind to him. And now Taylor's in a position where he could possibly at least bring some justice towards what's going on to David. And he pushed out and he's got his reasons for it, but I think it's fucking bullshit. I go, why be a rock star if you're going to have to, if you're not going to be able to, to stand up for some things like that. So he hasn't really talked to me much. So the other night I saw him, I gave him a big hug and I kissed him on his forehead and he looked at me with this giant smile. And that's the first time we've talked and, couple of years oh, and, wow. and 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 we didn't i didn't see him after the show at the after parties i didn't you know we we, we played we played some gigs together at the um and japan you know foo fighters and, and abasalas we didn't say hi to each other so it's been a little a little weird so i doubt i'll be able to tell him to give you a call <laughs> <laughs> but may, 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 maybe i'll call him and i'll we'll get him on and We'll try to make you and him right again. We'll try to make you guys whole. No, I love the guy. He's like my little brother, but you know, he's got to figure that shit out for himself. Yeah. <laughs> Fair yeah. enough. He's, Stevie. Right. He's, my, he's my man, but you know, yeah, it's not talking all the time. Yeah. Stevie, this has been awesome. Uh, we will definitely reach out to you again. I'm going to uh, right. uh, finally grab your book, give it a read, and, and we'll talk about some rock and roll stories as well in the future. 
Thanks so much. All right, guys. Have a great night. You as well. Take care. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye.